pastors, we are taught not to give apologies before we speak. This is the exception. In this speech, Danielle will share an, ex an emotional insider with an honest and raw story that will expose her truth. In her speech titled, Unspoken Truth, Danielle will share details of her recent life events that may make you cringe and possibly want to leave the room. Consider this a warning and an advance apology for the bluntness you're about to listen to. Danielle urges everyone to remain present, both physically and emotionally, and open your minds to her, un to her unspoken truth, the truth that may reveal, the truth that many never speak about. This is the first speech of Project 3 in Pathways, Understanding Emotional Intelligence. The purpose of the speech is to cultivate an understanding of how Danielle's emotions impact relationships and to share some aspects of her experiences being aware of emotions when interacting with others. The speech time is seven to nine minutes. Please help me welcome Danielle to the lectern. including poison ivy, peridermal oral rosacea, poison sumac, allergies to the sun, allergies to laundry detergent, and the list goes on. In October, there was no exception to my skin showing me how much hate it had for my soul. <laughs> I started getting this itch on, the, on my left breast. And at first, it was just an itch. There was nothing visible. And I was convinced that my husband had once again given me poison ivy because I swear when he does yard work, he rolls around in the poison ivy, comes inside, and gives me a hug. <laughs> I had threatened his life because I had just recovered from a three-month stint of poison ivy because my skin hates me and it just never goes away. As this itch persisted, a rash started to form, and the rash was covering my whole torso. I thought it would just go away, and I had tried all the natural remedies, <coughs> but after a few weeks, I realized that I really needed to go see a dermatologist. When I saw her, she said, oh, that's eczema. And I said, but I'm 32, and I've never had eczema before. And I thought eczema was like your skin was dry, and you were itchy, and I... I have used lotion every day when I get out of the shower for my whole life, and I just really don't think it's eczema. But she didn't question it, and she prescribed me a topical steroid. She said, the rash should be gone in three days. So I'm anxiously awaiting the three days as I'm itching through the night, itching all day, can't wear clothes, can't work out. This itch is horrible, and the steroid doesn't work. So I call back. And I said, okay, I need another steroid. What else can you give me? I get the other topical steroid. And she says, you know, Danielle, it's probably just stress. Because, you know, when you don't know a diagnosis, the easiest thing to say is it's just stress, right? Well, this, this time in my life, I wasn't really feeling stressed. So I'm thinking, man, if, if the other times in my life were stressful and I didn't develop eczema, I really don't understand what's going on. So I have this rash, and other weird things started happening. Like, I felt a little heavy. And I had been working out seven days a week, and I was at the peak of my fitness journey, and I just felt like I didn't look as lean as I should. And then I was driving with my warehouse manager, who has a heavy foot, let's just say that. And I always feel sick when I'm in the car with him, but. This time, the nausea lasted for about an hour after I got out of the car. And then I'd be in my workouts and I felt like my endurance was slowing down and I just was out of breath and I wasn't as motivated to do my extra runs. I was having weird aversions to food 
including sparkling water, out of all things. <laughs> I couldn't drink sparkling water anymore. And the only things I wanted to eat were carbs. And I mean, pasta for dinner, pancakes for breakfast, grilled cheese for breakfast. I mean, it was like I couldn't eat enough carbs. So one week I had scheduled on a Friday night, a pizza night with my two girlfriends. And it was like, this pizza was the holy grail. Like I couldn't stop thinking about this pizza. And so I was eating with them and I'm eating like all the pizza slices. And, and I was saying that I had been experiencing these cramps and I should be getting my, you know, time of the month soon. And they're like, well, you've been off birth control now two months because I got married in June and I thought I could flush it out of my system and give myself some time before I had planned this moment in my life. But these cramps were really bad and I thought, okay, my body is just reacting to being off of the pill that I had been on for 15 years. They convinced me that it was just stress, so I thought, okay. So the next morning I wake up and I ran a five mile race and I hit my PR and that day the cramps persisted to a point that I was on the floor. I, I was immobile. I, I thought, this is it. Like, it's this time of the month. It's taken my life from me. I'm itchy. I'm hungry. And I'm just, I can't go to the bathroom. And everything is changing. And I don't know what's happening. So it was 7.30 on a Saturday night. And I called my friend. And I said, OK, my period, you know, not the punctuation mark, the thing that women get, OK? It's not here. But I've had cramps for 48 hours. And she's like, well, how late are you? And I'm like, well, let me do the math, okay? Six, seven, I think I'm like nine days late. She's like, um, Danielle, I think you need to take a pregnancy test. And I'm like, well, I've never taken one. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing. What do I do? And she's like, okay, you're gonna go to the store, you're gonna buy a digital pregnancy test, but buy a two pack because we don't know if the first one's gonna work. And I want you to come to my house and I will hold your hand and I will sit with you in the bathroom and we're going to get through this and it's okay. She's like, you're probably not pregnant. I, I really think it's stress. So I'm like, okay. So I go in the pharmacy and it's, you know, pretty empty. Eight o'clock on a Saturday night. And I'm like, well, I can't just buy a pregnancy test. Like, this is embarrassing. So I bought a bag of candy because, what, I mean, I just had to buy something else. So I bought these little peach things that I buy probably once every 10 years. And I check out and I'm like mortified. Thank God I have a wedding ring. I, I'm still like, okay, this is so embarrassing. This isn't socially acceptable. <coughs> and then I proceeded to go to my friend's house. She has a newborn baby that's two months old. So her husband took the baby and she went with me in the bathroom. And she's like, okay, you're gonna sit down, you're gonna pee on this stick. And it takes about three minutes for the result. I'm like, all right. Okay, and I'm still thinking like there's no way. Like I'm good, this is, this is just stress. Cause that's what my dermatologist told me and that's what everyone's saying. So I take my pants down, I pee on the stick, I put it on the counter. I didn't even have my pants up. And my friend said, um, um, Danielle, you might wanna look over here. And I look over and I saw the word that was the scariest word I have ever seen. Pregnant. Not in three minutes, guys. <laughs> three seconds. I screamed so loud that her cats jumped out of their beds and were at the door wondering what was happening in the bathroom. So here I am with my pants down, a positive pregnancy test, peach candy in my hand, and I am screaming, shaking, crying, hyperventilating, like this is the worst day of my life. And I think for many people, their first pregnancy is joyful and exciting and amazing, but I'm a type A personality and I like to plan these things. <laughs> and this wasn't in my plan. And I certainly was not expecting this news on a Saturday. So she's like, well, you need to go home and tell your husband. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, like I can't even do this. And, and I know he's going to be excited. And I'm over here not so excited. So I go home and I'm
crying. I've got running mascara. I look like I've been run over by a truck. And I just show him the test, and he starts crying, and he's hugging me, and I'm crying, but not for the same reasons. <laughs> and he's like, this is the best day of my life. This is what I've been waiting for. I can't wait to be a father. And I'm like, okay, nobody, nobody is going to understand what I'm going through, because my husband thinks this is the best thing in the world, but he's not the one that has to give up his physical, emotional, mental stability for 10 months. So I let him have his joy. He's like on the floor, like this is the best day ever. <laughs> He's holding the pregnancy test and that's when I realized that my unspoken truth was something that I didn't feel most people could listen to and not pass judgment on me for. And it's hard because my reality was I was grown up and told that my whole family, all the females in my family, my mom, my four aunts, my grandmother, they all had three to four miscarriages each. This is what I was conditioned for. Like, it's going to be a hard road. This is not easy. And then I have my best friend who I was with and who had just had the baby who had been through an ectopic pregnancy and almost died through surgery, internal bleeding. She had two other miscarriages. My other best friend had three miscarriages in 18 months and was, you know, depressed and dealing with that. I have another friend who's younger than me, has been through IVF and failed IVF. Another friend through IVF. I mean, this is just what I'm, this is my environment. So I'm conditioned to think this is scary there's a lot of fear associated with your pregnancy. Nothing is guaranteed. We don't know what's going to happen. But what I do know is this is not exciting. And I couldn't tell my friends that because obviously they're looking at pregnancy much different. So they probably wouldn't be empathetic towards my story because they're thinking, I want pregnancy so bad, how could anybody not feel the same way? And from my perspective, my unspoken truth was I was scared. I had my 2020 planned out. This was not in my plans. I thought I could plan when this would happen. I didn't think that I would lose all my fitness gains like that. I wasn't ready for that. I didn't think that my best year at work would possibly be changing because I won't be able to work as much with a newborn. So I was dealing with all these emotions. The symptoms persisted. Holy moly. I could not stop eating carbs. I had this rash that would not go away and it was making me crazy. And my husband said, all right, you've got to tell three people. You've got to tell your chiropractor, you have to tell your massage therapist, and you have to tell your trainer. And I'm like, but it's early. I don't have to tell anybody. <laughs> and he said, no, Danielle, because I don't want anything happening to you, and I want you to, this, this has to be perfect, and I need this healthy baby, because this is my dream, and you need to tell these people. So first I tell my chiropractor, and he's like, all right, well, you can't get all the treatments that you've been getting. And I'm like, there goes one happiness. <laughs> <laughs> then I tell my trainer, and she's like, all right, no more HIIT workouts. We have to drop your weights, nothing above 65 pounds. I'm like, there goes the rest of my joy. <laughs> then I tell my massage therapist, and I am like the deep tissue guru. Like when I get a massage, the elbow better be inside of me for me to feel any recovery. And she's like, no more deep tissue. And I'm like, okay guys, this is like, my life is gone and all my happiness is gone and what is happening? So I told two people, aside from my husband's list, and my two people were my photographer because I said, I need you to get me in a studio ASAP to get my fitness journey captured because this is not going to be the same ever again and I need something to motivate me to get back to where I was. First person I told. Second person I told, my insurance agent, I said, hey, remember when I signed that maternity insurance policy? When is that effective? He's like, you just made it by 30 days. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. 
So no one else knew. And I just keep living my life, just ignoring everything that's going on, because I thought it'd be easier. Then, my husband had his company Christmas party on Wednesday. It was actually the night before our Toastmasters Christmas party. And I had planned out to wear a Christmas dress, you know, which was form-fitting, and it was looked like the Christmas plaid. And I had packed it the day before, and I thought that day, I'm like, I really think I'm starting to show, but that can't be right because it's too early. And people say on your first pregnancy, you don't show until like four months, so it's, it can't be right, it can't be right. So I put the dress on, I didn't have a full length mirror, and I go to the party, and I'm like, okay, I really think I look pregnant, but I must be going crazy, and I'm eating pizza again, and I'm like, okay, maybe they'll just make some pizza. And then my friend pulls me aside, and she's like, okay, so like you look pregnant. I'm like, okay, where and when did this happen? Overnight, now I look pregnant? This is crazy, okay. So now I'm wearing baggy clothes. <laughs> for a week until my first ultrasound, which was at 10 weeks. On Wednesday, December 18th, I had my first ultrasound, and before the ultrasound tech put anything on my stomach, I was crying. And she's like, why are you crying? And I was like, because this is scary. And she's like, but why? <laughs> and I'm like, because this is the moment where I have to face what is happening and how my life is about to change and she's like, well, this should be a happy moment. And this is why <laughs> you can't tell people sometimes how you really feel, because it's scary. So she puts the thing on me, and she's moving it around, and she's like, there's no baby. And this is exactly why I had all the fear that I had, because I didn't really feel like going through this at this moment in my life. So she's like, well, there's one problem. Your body doesn't know that the baby didn't develop. So you still are full term. Your sac is full term. Your hormones are still raging. You're still having all the symptoms, but the blueberry never became the gummy bear. So there were no arms and legs. It just stopped developing. And if I'm going to say my honest thoughts at the time, I felt, I felt two things. I felt relief in many ways because I just didn't feel right about it. And on the other side of things, I thought, well, this sucks because now I've got to go through this and I've seen my friends go through it and it's not something I wish upon anyone. So she's, it, this was a Wednesday and she said, okay, well, you have two options. You can either induce the miscarriage at home or you can get a DNC, which is essentially a vacuum that sucks out your insides. So I thought, well, the less traumatic option is to be at home. And <coughs> I was told it was like bad period cramps. But for some reason, she wanted to prescribe me Oxy, which is like the scariest thing ever, for bad period cramps. And I said, absolutely not. So I persisted to do that on Saturday, December 21st. And when I said that some of you might want to leave the room, this is the moment, okay? I'm gonna keep it PG, but <coughs> it is what it is. I had to inject four tablets vaginally to induce a miscarriage. That in itself is like not enjoyable, okay? And you're supposed to feel the first set of cramps within 10 minutes, and then within 48 hours, you are supposed to pass the placenta, and it should be over. And I felt the cramps within 10 minutes, but then within an hour, I was having a reaction that the doctor didn't exactly explain. So at this point, I'm at 10 and a half weeks, and my other friends had done this a lot earlier, so I called my one friend and I said, I feel really funny and I don't think this is normal. And she's like, well, I think it's still starting and just kind of wait it out. And then about 15 minutes later, <coughs> I fainted, fell on my bathroom floor, had a huge bump on my head, had a concussion and was throwing up 
like every two seconds, like back to back, crazy, not normal. So at this point, I call my friend back and she's like, I don't think that's normal. I think you need to call the hospital hotline, tell them the medication and ask them if this is a normal reaction. I called the hospital, they told me this is not normal, you need to come in right now. By this moment, I can't even change my clothes. I can't lift my legs, I can't open my eyes, and I can't speak. I'm completely limp on my bathroom floor. Good thing my husband is physically fit because he had to lift my body down the stairs into his truck, park in front of the ER entrance, carry me inside the ER, put me in a wheelchair. The first thing they do is ask your name. Well, of course, now I have two last names, which is gonna be a great story to tell when I can't even talk. So, I could barely make it through Danielle, and I had to throw up again. So I have him carry me to the bathroom, and it's just nonstop, and I can't, I can't even open my eyes. I'm in the ER for seven hours to what I find out is an allergic reaction to this medication, which no doctor around had ever seen, of course. I somehow made it. I didn't think I was going to. I felt like I was dying. My body was in so much pain. It was horrible. It was the worst day ever. So, when I tell you that this is my unspoken truth, it's because there are only so many places when you can share your real opinion about what you're going through, what you're experiencing. And obviously in my network, it's not socially acceptable to feel the way that I did, where I felt just not ready for something like this. <coughs> and it's not that I couldn't be a great mom, or it's not that I have a house, I have, a me I have the means to take care of a child. It's not that, it's just that it was the most overwhelming, scary, unexpected news that I had dealt with and I just felt like I wanted to plan this so that I could be the most mentally physically and emotionally ready mother so that I could be the great mom that I never had so there was this extra pressure and going through all of this made me realize that you cannot judge somebody based on your experiences when they're going through something similar because everyone has a different situation and it's important to put yourself in their shoes. That's what empathy is. And I think that this room has given me a platform to share my vulnerable, dark, and honest, unspoken truths for almost four years. And that's why I felt comfortable sharing my story with this room.